Hello and welcome. My name is Nicole Kennard, Senior Project Manager at Collier's Project Leaders here in Edmonton, Alberta, and I'm your moderator today. For the next hour, I'm honored to welcome you to a discussion on influencing supply chain diversity in capital projects. Our panel of industry experts will address questions and challenges faced by key stakeholders in the process. We include owners, project managers, design and engineering consultants, and contractors. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that our work takes place within ancestral, traditional, treaty, and unceded territories, which continue to be home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We continue to benefit from our presence on these lands and are committed to reconciliation. Now, let's meet our panelists. First, it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Ryan Fleury. Hi, good morning. Uh, Ryan Fleury, I'm with uh, Microsoft. I am a real estate portfolio manager based in the greater Toronto area. In my role, I'm responsible for overall real estate strategy for portions of Canada and the Midwest. I do everything from planning, building and living and operating, and I partner internally with my key executive stakeholders, validating needs and plans. And uh, I work with my delivery teams to build awesome intelligent workspaces to support those business groups. Thank you, Ryan. Now let's welcome Cassandra Dorrington. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Cassandra Dorrington. I'm the President and CEO of Canadian Aboriginal Minority Supplier Council. We identify and certify diverse suppliers and um, promote them into the supply chain of Corporate Canada. So I'm delighted to be able to talk about what work we've done with Collier's project leaders and their partners. Glad to be here. Thank you, Cassandra. Let's bring in Demi Grand. Hi, good morning. My name is Demi Grand. I am the manager of interiors for Synergy Projects, general contractor out of Edmonton, and I was acting as the project manager on this project. Welcome, Demi. And finally, our very own Benita Craig. Hi, Bonita Craig. I'm the Managing Director within the Collier's Project Leaders Infrastructure Advisory Group. And I also wear the hat of being our diversity and inclusion champion across our business. What that practically means is I work with our over 700 practitioners in project management, advisory, construction solutions to help find the best ways to bring supply chain diversity into our capital projects and make diversity and inclusion real in the work that we do with our clients so we can help them meet their supply chain diversity and diversity and inclusion goals on projects. Great. Well, we're pleased to have you here with us today, Vanita. Before we get started, we have two housekeeping items. First, uh, this webcast will begin with panel discussion followed by a 10-minute Q&A. Feel free to enter your uh, questions in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen and we will address them at the end. Secondly, please note that we will be recording this session. A link to the video will be made available to all attendees in a post webcast email. Please feel free to share that with colleagues and friends and family. Okay, now let's dive right in. Ryan, we're gonna start with you. I'd like you to introduce us to the project itself and give us some background on Microsoft's commitment to diversity and inclusion. Sure, yeah, that sounds good, Nicole. Um, you know, maybe on top of that too, what I'll do is I'll give a little bit of background on the overall Canadian portfolio landscape as well to kind of tee up uh, the Edmonton project. So um, I co-manage the country with my peer. Uh, between the two of us, we have 15 sites across the country and we're just shy of about 600,000 square feet of space. Um, our sites are unique and they support multiple job functions from sales to support roles, engineering and researching. Um, during the pandemic, we delivered four amazing new sites and an expansion. Um, one of the sites that I think I'm really happy about and super proud of is uh, our new Canadian HQ, our headquarters located in Toronto at the new CIBC Square. Uh, just a beautiful office overall. Uh, we delivered just uh, over 130,000 square feet and uh, we've you know, across the whole portfolio in Canada, we've actually now been able to start to welcome employees back, which has been super exciting. And the, the reception and, and feedback has just been outstanding. So um, really, really exciting news on that front. Um, in terms of Edmonton, you know, we had, um, we've had a regional office presence since the mid 2000s. 
Um, in 2019, Microsoft acquired a company. So between acquiring this business, which eventually those employees then transitioned into being Microsoft employees, and kind of a dated existing office experience, kind of kind of not not brought into the the, the newer intelligent workspace. We ended up having a, a great opportunity to invest some capital to invest the uh, to in, to enhance and invest in the employee and customer experience for the Edmonton market. So you know we we planned a lot through much of 2020 internally. You know we did a lot of validating with our clients and and you know their future needs. And we kicked this project off in early 2021. Um, well, I was super excited for the project and everything that goes into the project around designing space and, and you know, bringing on project teams and all the work that goes into it. I really wanted this project to be different than anything we'd done in the Canadian landscape. And it was specifically around supplier diversity, um, which ultimately was inspired by the racial equity initiative at Microsoft. Um, with a goal of more inclusivity, both inside and outside the company. Um, you know, what we have seen is, is, is about a third of our suppliers right now working on Microsoft act, active construction projects in the U.S. now are, my, are minority-owned businesses, um, including with people with disabilities, um, diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds, and gender identities. So really, as we kicked the project off, um, I was like, how can we translate this into Canada? Um, it was uncomfortable from my perspective, a uh, little bit of a fish out of water. Um, I found that, you know, working with my peers in the U S and some of the things I was doing in that landscape, it was a little bit more easy to validate and track kind of accreditation certifications. And this was not something that we had explored here before. So uh, it was a new adventure for us. And in my opinion, um, you know, not only did Collier's project leaders and Synergy step up to the plate, they took a swing and they like literally hit a home run with this and, and just a fantastic job. Um, from the offset of the project that we're doing in Edmonton, you know, the design phase specifically, what I was really envisioning was a sense of community for the whole project um, from, from everything that we were doing. And how could we best focus on hybrid work and what that may look like without really knowing at that point in time, but how could we also design the space that could adapt over time to kind of when we do some, well, now that we brought them back, but when we were eventually going to start welcoming people back, what does that look like? So uh, here we are today, April 28th, and we are getting ready to deliver this amazing site uh, in June, uh, an office that's just over 10,000 square feet of space. Um, integrating both that acquired business group and our existing teams that we already had in Edmonton into one office focusing on intelligent workspace, focused on community and collaboration, enhancing customer experience with a beautiful reception area, teams-enabled meeting rooms, multi-purpose space with roomy breakout areas to host events. Um, our employee area is going to focus on flexible work, ample meeting areas, focus rooms, an employee hub that is just amazing. And I'm super excited about this piece. Uh, kitchen that'll allow both groups to come together and really unite, unwind and create a sense of community. So I'm super proud of the project, uh, the work that we've done uh, collaboratively, co collaboratively um, up to this point. And obviously in a time of uh, project delivery during COVID, it's come with a little like bit of hurdles here and there. But what I can say is that uh, I have not felt a lot of that pain because I do think that Nicole and Demi have just done a fantastic job managing that uh, and alleviating the stress as the, uh, as the owner of the project. So thank you for that. It's very oh, much appreciated. Thank you, Ryan. That's very kind. And just so everybody's aware, I was the, the, the and am the designated project manager for Collier's project leaders on this. So um, that's one of the reasons I'm moderating today and also just because I wanted to be a part of this amazing discussion. So, Benita, I, I want to tack on to what Ryan was saying. He already expressed this was a tall order because there were no models to follow in Canada. And the U.S. model was is well established and we did not have the same certifications in place. And we're, it's still a building thing happening. That's why we brought Cassandra on to talk some more about that. How did you guys get started? Uh, well, uh, going way back to even before we were selected as the owner's representative project manager, I remember getting a call from you, Nicole, saying we had the opportunity to work with Microsoft, but um, Ryan and his team were very forthright in their supplier diversity ambitions for this project from the outset. And we knew that um, 
our a successful response and the opportunity to help them deliver this project uh, required thoughtful consideration to how we would actually make that real. You know, we often see in RFPs um, in the market asks for, tell us about what you do about supply chain diversity, tell us about your diversity and inclusion policy. And it's increasingly easy, quite frankly, to submit the generic statement. It was really clear though that on this project and certainly has been our approach in all of those responses to do a lot more than just here's our generic statement, our commitment and our beliefs. Here's some of the ways that we're making it real in our projects. And this for us, I know Nicole, you and I were both really excited because we saw this project where a client had uh, ambitious goals as an opportunity to really develop and evolve what it meant on a project, everything from how do we do a kickoff meeting so that it's more inclusive? Uh, where are we going to find some of these diverse suppliers and start to build more standard practices uh, to roll out across our business? I mean, we deliver more than 15 billion of capital projects for private and public sector owners across Canada that aspire to this. And if we can start to get practice with it and have the tools to do it, it will help them reach their goals and help us leverage that impact. So for us, practically once the team was engaged and involved, it seems obvious, but the exercise of getting the right people in the room from each of those players, the people that had the ability to make decisions on behalf of their businesses that were open to new ideas, and amongst one another, establishing really early accountability. And that wasn't difficult because it just meant we got together every week and we said, great, here's what we're gonna do. And you had to report back on it a week later. And it seems obvious as I say this to the project manager that's nodding, but when we had a designated 30 minute call every week where all we were talking about was our supply chain diversity goals and how we were gonna do it, it was a really important forum for us to be held accountable and share ideas and actually make progress. The fundamental question that we as a group felt we had to tackle was what can we do on this project to maximize the number and diversity of suppliers that were invited uh, to the project and would in some way, shape or form participate. And when we kind of thought about it a little bit more, we broke that into two areas we worked on as a team. The first was, okay, well, where can we actually have impact and control? Uh, there are some areas where we can't. Um, so for example, Microsoft has, uh, if you've ever been to any of their offices, they're gorgeous spaces, and there's a certain design brand consistency, as you often see with clients like that. And, and it was important that this space still reflect their design ambitions and standards and the look and feel and the, 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 the community space they wanted to create. So there were some things that we couldn't, you know, dramatically change. That wasn't limiting, but we needed to acknowledge what are the areas we could have impact and control. So that's things like within design decisions, whether we specify certain products or materials. You know, we talked a lot about artwork and lighting as some of the main domains where we knew there would be a much broader diverse supplier base in some specific categories. Uh, we also then looked at construction and, you know, Demi, you could speak to, there's a lot of different trades obviously involved in making a, a tenant improvement project like this happen um, that we felt, okay, well, how can we get a more diverse and broader mechanical trade base or electrical or millwork? Um, and then lastly, we had to be really careful not just to look at the first tier suppliers that we would directly engage with, but encourage our suppliers to look into the second tier and third tier. Uh, often, you know, um, there's a, there can be a mix of whether you're buying both supply and install of products or materials and sometimes just labor separately. And so all of those things created different routes or avenues to broaden the diversity of the supply group. So that's that first question of the, where could we have impact and control? And then the second was, okay, great. We kind of set the boundaries, but how are we actually going to do this? And this is where uh, organizations like uh, Cassandra's came in because the first question was, well, where can we look for diverse suppliers? Uh, and quite frankly, it started with Google searches, chambers of commerce, community organizations, trade boards, um, industry organizations, and very quickly, though, uh, coming to discover uh, the Canadian Aboriginal Minority Supplier Council, Women Business Enterprises, you know, a, a number, and we'll talk about those later on. But network organizations that are emerging 
in the Canadian landscape and will be incredibly powerful in making supply chain diversity easier for projects going forward. Uh, the second question we asked was then, well, what are we going to say to some of these mm -hmm. diverse businesses that might not otherwise come after a project of this size or scale or nature, but might be perfectly qualified for it? How do we make sure we understand and address whatever barriers might exist to them wanting to bid on participate in work like this? And what can we do? We did um, have a conversation and acknowledge that a lot of times for a diverse organization they th there can be fear or hesitation about disclosing that they are um minority owned or a minority large workforce because in the past and in and maybe in many in many places still they there, there's fear of being discriminated against and so we needed to recognize that we couldn't just assume that given the opportunity everybody would jump at it uh, so we, we, we thought long and hard about where are we going to look for these suppliers? What can we say to them and what might be some of those barriers and what can we do as a team to address those barriers? So that really those questions kind of set out the framework for us then to meet weekly and track against and start to, to build a pipeline, quite frankly, um, of more and more diverse suppliers to participate in this project. And so Demi, I guess, we've gotten a really great framework from Benita on sort of the big picture stuff. And then you, you sort of became the funnel, how we took all of those strategies and connections and ideas and language. And then you were the boots on the ground having to figure out how to do it. So we'd love to hear more about how you did that. And then, you know, how did the market respond? What did you, yeah. For sure. Um, I'm not going to lie. At first, I was overwhelmed. Um, it's not something I've ever been involved in. And when Benita talked to me at first, I went, whoa, she's way smarter than I am. And I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> so naturally, I did what everybody I'm sure on this call would do. And I hit up the World Wide Web. I began researching <laughs> employment, equity acts, local organization, like mm -hmm. B or WN, um, CAMSC and Startup Edmonton. And I went down that rabbit hole for a good three nights. My husband knows a lot about those organizations now. <laughs> we began generating a voluntary survey um, internally at Synergy here where we could issue that would let us obtain a catalog of local businesses in the market that self-identify as diverse businesses. We were very careful in that survey to ensure that while we're collecting data, it's voluntary and no trade or vendor will be excluded if they don't meet these requirements. Um, one question we did ask in the survey was to briefly describe your willingness to collaborate with the client on improving diversity of the client's supply chain so that it also started the conversation and it started the thought process within the market. The voluntary self-identification survey questions were based on guidelines used by the Federal Contractors Program. This include ensuring that their workforce is representative, or representative of Canada's labour force with respect of members of following the four designated groups under the Employment Equity Act. We issued this online survey to 774 trade suppliers and manufacturers in our market. We were able to provide the results of this survey then to the design team, to Microsoft and to Collier's project leaders so that they can make their own informed decisions on what products, materials would go into the design of the space prior to hitting the construction phase or the tender phase. Yeah, I think it's important to note that part of that, Demi, that we didn't um, explain to everyone that the framework of this project was construction management contract and that actually became an important part of how we were able to achieve this goal if we'd left this to the tender only a, a traditional design bin build I think the challenge would have been potentially insurmountable so um, just as a lesson learned I'm going to jump in now and say that was one of the best decisions we made at the beginning of the project and we didn't even know why at the time but I'm so glad it, it um, benefited us um, Cassandra I want to hear from you now about um, can you just weigh in a little bit on what you're hearing about Demi's approach? Is this unique? Have you experienced this before? And then Demi, I, we still haven't heard your market response. So I want to get back to that because I know you've got some at least one or two interesting stories. But Cassandra, would you mind just jumping in a little and telling us your thoughts? Well, thank you very much. I'm smiling as I hear this because this is a typical story. 
this is a very typical story. Whether it be part of the conditions of the RFP, whether it be a request from your client, whether it be part of your organizational goals, someone's identified, we want to include diverse suppliers in our supply chain. And we're all used to using those core suppliers we've had for the past 10 years, five years, last three projects. We know them, we know how to work with them. Now, when you tell me to introduce someone new to the table, it's like, oh my God, what does that mean? What does that look like? And so therefore, exactly what Demi has done is everyone's like, oh my God, they gotta be someplace, what am I gonna do? There are councils across Canada. We've been doing this now for about 18 years in Canada, obviously very quietly because the ones who know it, know it well, and the other ones all of a sudden said, did you just emerge? So we've been going out to the market. Let me, let me step back again to say, supplier diversity that we're talking about, this inclusive procurement we're talking about is really the proactive approach to including diverse suppliers into your supply chain. It's a proactive, it's not talking about excluding anybody else, it's not talking about guarantee of work, it's talking about a proactive approach to have them bid on opportunities to include them in supply chain. So we've been doing this and we've been reaching out to the community I'm one of about four councils, about four councils across Canada who have different constituency groups who I focus on Indigenous and people of color owned businesses, 51% owned managed control. There's an LGBT focus, there's a women focus, there's a veterans and persons with disability focus. Those are four councils, and all we're doing is we're out there outreaching the community, identify these businesses, certify their own managed control on a yearly basis to make sure nothing changes. Because what happens if you hire these people? They hire people who look like them, they build wealth in the community. And so we've been doing that. So we effectively have a database of that. So while Demi's out running, trying to find and create her own database, lo and behold, she finds that, my God, there's people who have these out there and I don't have to go through that. And so exactly what she's got, those are the beginning steps. So what we want to be able to do is get more, um, more recognition that there are steps out there to help you do that. There are steps out there so you don't have to worry about, am I legally asking the right question? Am I stepping on toes? Am I impacting my other suppliers? that we help you through that process. So this is very familiar. So that's why I'm smiling. And I love the fact that as the story unfolds, it's a good news story. Everything you learn sort of helps you open, open the door to other opportunities. Thank you. And not to say we wouldn't have been brave enough to do this, this webcast anyway, if it hadn't been a good news story, because frankly, uh, the process has been so fantastic. That would have been enough to tell the story. The fact that we were successful in supporting Microsoft's goals makes it a much more exciting hero's journey. But um, Demi, so you being the hero, I think of this story, tell us a couple of stories around uh, how the market responded. I know you've, have, you've got a range of, of stories to tell. Yeah, I, I could write a book on this and it would be wonderful and entertaining. Um, but how did the market respond? They responded loud and clear with a wide range of responses. Um, I'll preface that if you're going to start going down this process, and I highly recommend that everybody does, make sure that you leave probably about two to three days open in your schedule when you're issuing this survey, as you will be flooded with emails, calls, and texts, wide range of responses. Overall, we learned that there's a lot of really proud individuals in Canada that are willing to share and volunteer this information. They provided a response of how proud they were as an organization to have a diverse culture through their ownership labor force and supply chain. It was quite rewarding to see the level of detail and information these firms were willing to provide and how diverse our industry really is. A lot of the trade partners came back with initial responses of no and declined. But as we started to reach out or take the phone calls, the emails, the texts, we began to survey them and challenge them. They started to think more than is my company owned by a self-identified diversity group? They started to think of what are my employees? How do my subcontractors apply to this? How do my suppliers apply to this? How do my transporters supply to this? The list can go on, but I'll stop there. Self-identifying groups. I truly believe that this has been a positive change from this activity as organizations are now more self-aware of their inclusion and they're challenging those as well internally. We did receive some negative responses. I would be lying to you if we didn't. Um, and it was the industry felt that by the ownership of their company, it would exclude them through this tender process, which was not the intent at all. We challenged them then to inventory their workflow, where they buy their goods from, how it gets to site, and they started to realize how diverse they really are. A lot like I just mentioned previously. 
Also, once we began to further explain that the supply chain or that the survey is not intended to be exclusionary, but more of a catalog, the diversity within the existing supply chain, we found a very positive response to participate. And this was a conversation starter. Businesses started reaching out if they didn't feel like they could self-identify to other businesses that they could partner with on this project to then encourage the diversity within the marketplace. That, that, I mean, oh, Cassandra, go ahead. I just want to say, as Demi's talking about the survey, I want to just make sure people understand when you put the survey out, and I'm sure Demi did that, lay the foundation for what you're asking. Because other than that, you're going to get a lot of negative feedback. Why is this happening and everything else? But the foundation is we're trying to be more inclusive. We're trying to build this inclusive environment. So we're encouraging you to do this. So if you lay the foundation right, you'll still get, Demi, you'll still get some negative feedback, but more people will understand the whole purpose of what you're trying to do. And they're going to come forward with that response. Yeah, and ultimately, when it came down to, you know, DNI, this was one of one of the measurables, certainly in the during the tender process, but not the, the final arbiter, the intention here was to identify diverse suppliers and give them an opportunity to be competitive. And where they were competitive, they were awarded the work. And that's the that's the best part of this story. They rose to the occasion and they and, and they have in their work as well. Ryan, did you? Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I think you hit the nail on the head there. Um, no pun intended to the being in construction. But <laughs> the, it, construction it, jokes. Yeah, <laughs> less, less in exclusivity, more inclusivity for the project. Listen, you, you bid, you know, well, there, the, there's a goal line, right? Like we, we may not reach the goal line and that's okay, right? And, and, and that, 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 that's the thing. But getting to that goal line whether or not somebody bids on the job and gets it, we've now been able to put something in our Rolodex for, for future, right? Like, you know, maybe they didn't get it today, but two years from now, three years from now, maybe they've built up a little bit more even, and then we can start awarding a different, different so really at the end of the day, the pipeline is growing, right? And, and, and that was, that is still a win, you know, you know, aside from the goal line, it's, it's it, the ultimate project wins and, 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 and society wins too. So. Nicole, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll add to that, that um, as a, you know, this was, I mentioned at the beginning, we wanted to treat this as kind of a, a pilot of, of tools and techniques and ways we could do this at scale across Canada. And when uh, I started like Demi with this building our own database, Googling exercise, looking on the web, um, I realized that's how we came across these network organizations and it catalyzed colliers to pursue membership and participation in a lot of these organizations because of the value of the resources and expertise they provide um, and that that could be a whole other webcast in its own right but what it also made me realize when i uh, engaged with a lot of our project managers from across canada to understand how and, and when clients ask how are you choosing which uh, construction manager or design team or trades you might engage on a project, it's, it's probably no surprise to learn that within certain geographies and markets, our senior leaders have a Rolodex of the partner organizations that they're accustomed to working with that have done great work for other clients of that project type. Um, you know, those are the, the, the 10, 15 people that they'll go to and invite on a project. And it became very apparent that we, and, and Cassandra alluded to this, in order to reach the goal of more suppliers and more diverse suppliers on this project, we have to intentionally seek out people we haven't worked with before. I remember on one of our Friday sessions, Nicole, you, you know, we were, we were mentioning a couple firms and trade groups that we had all worked with before. And you said, but wait a second, we're doing it again. How do we make sure that we go outside of the box? We can't possibly know of the organizations we don't know. And again, I'll, I'll keep harping on this. It's, you know, organizations like Canadian Aboriginal and Minority Supplier Council are doing the heavy lifting and have been, and you described it perfectly, Cassandra. I thought, oh, these surely these are new and have just been created and they haven't. And they've got um, big diverse, um, memberships that um, are keen to engage with the marketplace and leverage those, but it's it's human nature to be comfortable working with the 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 partner companies and businesses that we've worked with before and we know, uh, and that is at our 
peril in many ways because it, it means we're losing out on the opportunity to, to do even better with more different suppliers. You know, we get a lot of trust and reliability of those we know, but that's not to say that we can't with those that we don't. Yeah, and that leads into, a, really, I wanted to go back to, as well, to Cassandra's point about how fortunate we've been to have a client as sophisticated as Microsoft, who not only already had um, DNI goals in place, but already had infrastructure and templates and an understanding of how to measure them, how to track them. And they, we were fortunate they provided us with those tools so that we were able to, you know, execute that piece and track and measure flawlessly. And that gave Ryan the confidence to be able to go back to the corporate team and, and you know, and and champion further, you know, that we've achieved our goals. And Ryan, I know you've got on your end um, some more involvement with procurement on how DNI works. Did, did you have conversations about how this was being tracked and how we would measure success that it was recognized within the company? Yeah, uh, what I can confirm, like, is definitely, it's definitely recognized, is definitely tracked. Um, in, you know, I think in, in, in terms from my my kind of role in the project, you know, I don't necessarily see the end product. You know, I see kind of at the end of the project when, when there's a, an, an amazing report and a dashboard built and I see like all the great stuff plus all the conversations that we have. But I think through, through you know, the, the, the work that you're doing in, in conjunction and, and just so, so folks online know that I also have a delivery manager who is my, uh, um, who, who runs the project, who works directly with Nicole as well. So a lot of a lot of that stuff is kind of done in the back end between you know the the PM and the DM working with our procurement team, and then I kind of just see the the polished pro product at the end of the uh, end of it. So I, I probably doesn't answer your question, but um, probably gives a little bit of clarity on, on on my end and what I kind of see for for final product. Yeah, but it, it answers in that uh, we understand that at a corporate level there is a dashboard and it is being followed and tracked at a corporate level. So this isn't just about the project, this is about how Microsoft, you know, keeps it at top of mind across projects. So I, I think that does, does actually still answer yeah. the question. Yeah. And, and, and what I will say is that this whole thing, it, it continuously is, a, is, is evolving, right? Like this is still, mm -hmm. this is still new, right? Like this is, this is something that's only been, you know, in, in, in conversation now for I alluded to COVID years. It, it's it's all happened through COVID, right? Like it's it happened in the summer of of, of, of or spring summer of 2020, right? And and it's evolved over time. So I mean I mean I think that the work that we've done to date is fantastic. I think that the work that we're going to continue to do as we continue projects and and not just within the real estate organization of Microsoft, all departments and and all the different work that they're procuring through different different um, um job scopes and landscapes and microsoft i mean it, it, it's it's top of mind for everybody and and, and I, I think it's just going to go so much further yeah i certainly hope it does I, I mean i think we've spoken before about the influence this has hopefully on the market and to that demi maybe you can speak a bit about outcomes as well we've talked we've told everyone about the success of the project maybe you can speak from the perspective of the gc who is in the trenches um, about the outcomes yeah, I'll briefly touch on the tender process to a little bit, if that's okay, kind yeah, of please. part and parcel of that. So when we got this survey back, we realized that there's a lot of um, suppliers, manufacturers, and subtrades in the marketplace that were interested, but couldn't potentially take on the full scopes. So we also tried to pair a time of tender them with other subcontractors to kind of hit those marks both so that we were able to hit small businesses um, and kind of also open the eyes of our subcontractors of other businesses that might be out there that we typically work with. Um, the or results of the survey also allowed us to see that when we tendered to the subtrade market, how much of diversity and inclusion requirements were already built into the project. And we're able to see the flow th or that flow through the subcontractors while still maintaining a fair and transparent tender process which was a relief on my end for sure because it was it's stressful going into this i'm not gonna lie um we presented all this information that we received from the survey to the ownership group too for review and consideration for the project um, then the outcomes on that 
overall, we were able to understand how diverse our market really is. And it gives a different appreciation for the subtrades that we do and do not work with, understanding that a little bit as well. The market was robust enough to support it based on the specified products, the existing demographic of the Edmonton supply chain, and we were able to achieve this. We were able to challenge companies that didn't self-identify as diverse to see how they can be or how they already are. Yeah, Cassandra, what are your what are your takeaways from hearing this story? Without, I'm just going to preface this without the support of Cansey because we didn't know about <laughs> about you yet. What what are your thoughts? Well, I I smile and I nod because this. Uh, what you, I can't, I never get tired of hearing the story and over and over, over and over again, because it continues to add levels to this. So I love when people talk with a fair and transparent process, because they tend to think if they're bringing diversity and we might have to award or whatever. But what I'm hearing is these suppliers won these awards. They were recognized. They legitimately won these awards. So the nice thing about as between Ryan and Deming and how do you build this, there's key outcomes that come out of this pro- project like this one. One, the successful delivery of a great product, right? So you're looking at, we got this great space, it's all built up, so that looks good. But what also did, it debunks any of those myths about using small or diverse suppliers. Hey, guess what? They were able to deliver just this. It also helps these um, them, these diverse suppliers. You heard Demi say, we had some of them partnered together. We're creating new partnerships of how they're going to go into the marketplace again that they might not have done themselves. And they've also been able to, in some cases, in this in particular, held their own in some organization of work. They exceeded expectations. They turned out not only to be the, the diverse supplier of the year, but the div- supplier of the year because of what they delivered. So we're seeing this time and time again. But when I look at the outcomes on the other side, and we tend to want to think on a business perspective, not the other side. This diverse supplier that you brought into the table, it helped them build capacity in their own ranks. It helped them actually... This qual that they had, they completed this project, they can use on another project as they're bidding on to say, look at the work I've done that helps them garner other work that they're looking at doing. They can also tend to, guess what? Hire people who look like them. They live in communities, they hire people who look like them. They're actually building wealth in that community and they're actually sort of generating wealth in the economy. And, you know, uh, I was at a, I said the, I was, the other day I was at a session and we brought an indigenous woman in. She owned her own business and now she works for corporate. And she wanted people to know the outcome of what happens when supplier diversity works well. So she said, I'm working for this corporation. We go to a small town and it's a very small town that, you know, it's almost like a dying small town. There's not a lot of work. Businesses are leaving. Children are not staying there. They're leaving high school and going away. And so they come in and she's like, and I'm talking about diversity. And she said, you know, we should be talking about how do we help the small town? What happened is as they got more of these small diverse businesses working, they started generating the buzz in the town the kids started staying in the town. Other ancillary businesses moved into town. She said, I never thought about the impact it would have on generating business development, generating the economy. She said, it's amazing. So I say the same thing. When you think about the Edmonton project that you just done, the business you built up that now are ready to be able to deliver on other businesses. And you're seeing a, you're seeing a, a beef up in the economy based on what you've done. And the whole economy, not just the diverse economy, the whole economy. So there's so many outcomes out of this that I see time and time again that I never, I never tire of hearing this story. So we don't want to uh, move into Q&A without talking about lessons learned and takeaways from this. Uh, we want to be able to take the people who have joined us for this call and give them something to chew on um, and, and maybe learn from and launch potentially their own programs from. So Benita, I'd love it if you'd share with us your lessons learned and our takeaways from this. I I have two. The first is, if I haven't made it clear enough yet, to leverage the network organizations. And we'll share some resources at the end of the ones that Cassandra has referred to and that Colliers is now a partner and supporter of. Um, And then the second is to, I alluded to this at the beginning, but uh, I think really for owners to think about and, and and project teams to be choosing partners that are authentically committed and prepared to go the extra mile. I described the fact that it's always easier to work with people that we know. It takes effort and intention to work with people that we don't know 
But what we've certainly learned here is that it is more than worth the effort. Uh, the, the, the project outcomes and the, the, the deliverables of this new space are above and beyond, I think, what we as a project team in Microsoft could have ever hoped for. And we've done it by working with people that we didn't know. Uh, more people that we didn't know in a truly fair and transparent way. And so it's just acknowledging, though, that it takes people that are willing to try doing things differently, because that's that's not always the case. Yeah, that's that's fair. Thanks, Anita. Um, Demi, what are your thoughts? OK, I got four here. Okay. Uh, similar to when we discussed some of the negative responses we received from the survey, one takeaway that we have on the GC's perspective is giving more clarity ahead of time. A lot of the subs or suppliers were kind of put off by this. We next time wanna make it 100% clear that this is an intent to catalog and it's not an exclusionary exercise, but an opportune, or it's an opportunity exclusion. Where it was new to the industry, as we've seen a lot of diverse met or methodologies on contracting, which has become a more value-based selection criteria, I just got to say props to Microsoft. This is the first procurement where the owner, in my experience, has confidently or was confident enough to state that DNI was one of their value criteria for the project and where the market was a bit surprised as this one is, is one of the first times we've seen an owner do it um, as a procurement strategy. Props to Microsoft. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for challenging our industry, myself included, to kind of be part of this. Um, third one, the market's robust enough to support it. The trades and suppliers are willing to work on it and, you know, hit those criterias. Don't be afraid to ask the questions. I was worried and well, I, I were in stress with everything, but I was worried. I was stressed to ask these questions. Am I going to say the right thing? Am I not going to say the right thing? Don't be afraid. Reach out to organizations like Cassandra's. They'll help you or Bonita. She'll tell me what I can and cannot say and when I'm going to be in trouble. <laughs> Um, to ask those questions. And then last one is challenge the companies in the marketplace to think about how they get hit and identify as being diverse now or even in the future. Um, be that person to start the conversation on the next steps forward. Yeah, that's really great takeaways, Demi. And I think lots for people to think about. Ryan, I want to hear from you as the port man and the person responsible for ongoing work in Canada. What takeaways have you gotten from this experience? Sure. Um, well, well, I don't have a, a list of four like, like, like Demi, but, 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 I, but I, do have, I do have some thoughts. Um, you know, the biggest takeaway is like, it can be done. It can be done. Mm. Um, I was a skeptic. I was, I, I, I was the person that entered this with the goal or, or, or the vision but also skeptic, skeptical that it could be done. And, and, and because, the, you know, as we've started these conversations over the last couple of years with, with some of our suppliers outside of this project, you, you, you hear the, well, we can't do that here. We can't ask those questions here. We, there's no, not the same kind of accreditations in the state. So it becomes almost like that mythological, you, you, you begin to believe what you're hearing. Mm. And, 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 and you really just have to, as the as the owner of the project representing the company that's doing the project you you have to dip your toes in the water and you have to be a little bit uncomfortable to to tread it a little bit but you have to have and, and much what Benito was saying you have to have the right partner right you have to have the right partner to make this work and if you don't then it's not going to work and what I can say from the get-go was there was a passion you know, from the time that we met and, and we, 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 we went through the procurement process and heard, heard the bids, you know, there was a passion here for, for, for diversity and inclusion. And, and it wasn't just taking a course to say, hey, I took a DNI course online and I'm a diverse person. It was actually putting the work in to find the right folks to, to, to better the supplier, right? Supply industry. So um, those are the key things. And, and going forward, this is going to be embedded. Like it's something that that you have to challenge your your suppliers to 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 step up and and provide for your company to uh, be able to. So um, that would be my that would be my not four takeaways, but but general takeaways. 
And, and we could say I can echo Demi's, um, I guess, thoughts on thanking you as the leader of this to, to push it through and keep supporting the team and in our endeavors, because I know that that is critical. Having our owners, you know, supply, support us in these endeavors is, is the key. Um, and also just Microsoft as a leader in the, in the community, in the country, being able to stand for, forward of this and saying we've, we've not only led it, we've done it. And to, there's nobody better, I don't think, to be able to show showcase how it's possible. So thank you. It's reciprocal. So thank you. <laughs> you you <laughs> made it happen. No. Um, Cassandra, I would love your closing thoughts on this. Um, I think we want to talk a, just, can you talk a little bit about scalability in a community this size of Edmonton? It's not a small town. How does something like this impact us? And is it scalable for a corporation like Collier's Project Leaders, for example, who have 700 PMs across the country and how we might help sort of spread this? Okay. First of all, let me say congratulations on a project well done. A lot of bruises and cuts and bruises, but you picked yourself up and you did an incredible job. Plus, congratulations to taking the leadership. I love what I heard Ryan say in his testimonial. It, it can be done. It's as simple as that. So when we talk about going forward, a couple of things I want to put in, put in people's minds as they think about that. Building a robust supplier diversity program takes time. You, there's a lot of lessons learned this time around. When you do the next one, guess what? There's still going to be other lessons to learn. Because again, what you're doing is you're building a foundation. You're building a foundation of whether it be suppliers, whether it be processes, whether it be practices. And those are the things when you look at uh, Collier's and sort of as you move in it, you're going to start to build what does this process look like across our organization? It might be different in Edmonton than it is in Halifax, depending on the trades, depending on the sort of location, what you have access to. You have to think there's differences across the country that you're going to be looking at, the combination of that. So take that into effect. But when you use councils such as CAMC, We Be Canada, CGLCC, we are national. We have outreaches and partners across the country that can help you amass whatever you need to be able to bid on that. Plus, as more opportunities come down, uh, we'll have more suppliers come to the forefront. Suppliers come when they hear there's a great opportunity. Guess what? They come out and say, pick me, pick me. I want to bid on that because the opportunity fails itself of that. So I want people to realize there's a lot of diverse suppliers out there awaiting the opportunity to bid on these projects. So again, as Ryan said, I didn't think we have them, or Demi said, I don't know where they're at. They're out there. Let's make sure the opportunities come out. So as you look across the country, be aware of geography, be aware of the resources you can have access to that will help you go through this. I love when Ryan was talking about Microsoft because I've been, I've been, I've been talking to Microsoft for many years in the US as well as in Australia. They've done a tremendous job of embedding supplier diversity and building out their programs. And so I'm excited that Canadians now are doing that because I've said to others, Canadians tend to be nice people. We can't do this or we're already doing this. And what you realize is we're not doing it very well, but we can do it very well. So therefore I'm seeing the opportunities of the, the resources are there to help you just be brave enough to take that first step and there are plenty of us to be able to help you take the next step. And as, as Ryan has said, and as Demi has said, and help you embed it in your culture, that it becomes part and parcel. It's not on the side of the desk. It's part and parcel of what you do in every project. Thank you. And I think for me, it's uh, the, the, the key takeaway that I learned, Benita, I think highlighted this at the beginning, is this is not a, an endeavor you can undertake on your own. And I would not encourage that you do. This is a collaborative thing. This is a team thing. This is everybody, you know, sleeves rolled up, diving in and figuring out the, in the weeds, figuring out the details, how to make this happen without the owner support, without, you know, partnerships like with CAMC, for example, and without having a contractor who's willing to dive in headfirst, you, this is, this is really insurmountable. So reach out, like reach out to your network encourage these discussions, have them over a glass of wine at your next event, you know, start talking about it, make it important and bring it to the forefront and, and start building a team of people and a network of people who, who believe in this and understand its value to, uh, to, to our community. So thank you all so much. I'm going to go into just a couple of questions. Um, this one actually, Ryan, I'm going to direct to you. It says, Good to hear Microsoft is making supplier diversity a priority. I'm wondering what owners could do to help throughout the process. I think you're probably the best person to answer that. 
Yeah, you know, I think it kind of goes back to what, what we what we kind of were just saying in some of our takeaways, you know, as a, you, you have to find the right partner. If you don't have the right partner, you're not going to be successful, right? So I think that, that that that's very important. And I think that you have to be transparent when you when you have this when you have this I don't want I hate to use the word initiative. Like the you, you have this thing that you want to accomplish, right? You have to be transparent with your partners and your suppliers on on what you're really looking for. And you have to start asking maybe uncomfortable questions and digging a little bit deeper to challenge them a little bit further to get outside of their comfort zone and their box, right? Um, I always say like people do their best work when they're uncomfortable. And 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 you know, that, I think that that's something you can definitely do as an owner. I, I will add to that. Um, as I, I field a lot of these inquiries from clients across Canada, both private and public sector, that um, either through RFPs or through conversation, and a big part of why I think we were so empowered to be effective in this team is because Microsoft found the right balance of, as, as Ryan just said, being transparent and reasonably ambitious and specific about what they were looking to do, and then kind of just said, make it happen and provided support and guidance along the way as we came back to them with hurdles, with challenges, with questions, and were prepared to engage with us on it. They weren't overly prescriptive in how we did it, um, in how we even tracked it. We knew we needed to track things. We knew we, we wanted to work towards the goal, but they didn't say it's got to be in this, this, and this. And it just a afforded us the space to uh, tackle it in the best way that would meet their overall project goals, because this was one goal of many for a successful project. And so it, it gave us that space to do it effectively without it being overly prescriptive, either through tender documents and in how they engaged a project manager or otherwise. Thanks, Anita. I think there's one more, there's one question here that is on the top of everyone's mind, and that's how often are we now seeing owners looking for this requirement? Uh, and I, we've talked about this before about if you're working in any kind of government, um, big cities, any government, they're starting to hone in more and more on this. Can you tell us a bit more? Yeah, so I'd say at least 80% of RFPs, regardless of the, the what, what we're talking about, the, the procurement event being for, whether it's for professional services or a contract, includes something about diversity or the inclusion or supply, supplier diversity. Where I think there isn't good follow through is in requiring your project teams to develop actual plans for making it happen. I think as far as the, 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 the current procurement exercises go is ask for provision of information and commitments or intent, or sometimes voluntary disclosure of proportion of ownership or otherwise. But rarely do they challenge the marketplace to say, how can you improve the, the diversity of our supply chain on this project? How are you going to do that here? Uh, you know, walk us through some of the steps, some of the, the tools you might use. How do we know that you're not going to just go and choose the three architects that you're used to working with in this market? And that is where I think owners can go a little bit further because, yes, they're talking about it, but right now it's more just an exchange of information. Can I jump in on this one too? So it's actually kind of a heartwarming story. Um, as part of this process, I reached out to Startup Edmonton, had a great conversation with them. They were a great resource to use, which then when they started their new space um, for Innovate, as they're a, a subsidiary or branch, um, they've now made this one of their requirements. Um, so when they went through their RFP stage, they said, how do we do this? How do we make it happen? Luckily, I was successful in the project. Um, and so it was great to see that we're doing this again and we're just expanding it further and further. If I can tack, if I can tack onto that, what I'm hearing yeah. now, supplier diversity is now because it's underpinnings of your sustainability and the ESG goals. A lot more organizations are saying, "How do I fit this in?" So it's not just coming from there; it's coming as part of the overarching ESG goals. So if anyone's looking at that, if you haven't been tapped yet, that's coming down the pipe. Okay, so we are pretty much out of time. I know we still have a couple of questions, so. We are going to respond to those questions in, in writing. We'll respond in an email with those Q and A so everyone can see them as our follow up. I want to say thank you to each of you for the time it's taken to prepare for this and also be present for this today and all the support. It has been my privilege to work with each one of you over the last few months um, to come to this amazing 
conclusion. So thank you all. And back to everybody who has followed us today. Um, watch for a follow-up email where you'll see links to the organizations that we've spoken about today, including uh, Cassandra's, and also the uh, video link of the webinar. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Have a fantastic day. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you.